Hello everyone. Welcome to the final part of our tutorial on API rate limits. In some of the previous versions, we took a look at what an API rate limit is, explained the leaky bucket algorithm, and also talked through some of the benefits of GraphQL. But today, we're actually gonna put all of that into practice by making some real requests to the Shopify API and taking a look at what it means to responsibly consume our rate limit without running into any errors. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe down below so you get notifications every time we drop a new video. And just so you know, I'm using a new camera setup this time, so I might look a little bit different, but it's the same quality content. Let's jump right on into it. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually take some of those things that we talked about in terms of best practices and ideas and implement it in the business logic of this application that we're going to be working on for a development store that I've spun up. So welcome to the series. I'm gonna be using VS Code that I have set up here. Feel free to use whatever else that you like, but let's just go ahead and jump on in. One of the things that we wanna determine is when do you typically run into an API rate limit and then what do you do as a result? So this particular store, we have a bunch of products that are all associated to a commodity. They're gold bracelets. And because the price of gold fluctuates so much and in our development store, we actually make our products whenever the orders come in, we need to ensure that we're charging the right amount for them. So as the price of gold changes, the price of our products also change. And what that means is that every now and again, and that might be every hour, that might be every day, we take the entire product catalog and we update the prices based on the most recent price of gold that we know exists on the market. And so what I have here is basically a little node application where we're gonna take a look at what the products are that are on my shop that might be impacted by uh, adjustment in the price of gold, and then how I can implement some best practices in terms of updating those prices, but doing so in a way that respects the API rate limit and ensures my app isn't getting throttled. Here within my node application, I'm using uh, dot, uh, .env to control some of my environment variables for my API key and API password that we see here. All of this, again, basic authentication that's been set up on a private app on my development store. If you are new to GraphQL or any of this stuff looks intimidating, I'd highly recommend checking out the GraphQL video series on the channel as well by my good friend Chuck Cosman. Um, he walks you through all of those elements, including aliases and variables and anything that uh, might be discussed in this video that you haven't seen before. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about GraphQL concepts, so check that out if you're new it. But yeah, so we're using that to control our variables. We're using the GraphQL request package to be able to make some GraphQL requests pretty simply and then a little bit of other boilerplate setup. For the purposes of this tutorial, I'm not actually gonna set it up as an official Shopify app um, going through the app CLI and configuring it that way. We just wanna test this out to see what it would look like if we did have this business logic in our application. And if you're interested in app development, we have a a series on that as well with uh, Jennifer Gray, who talks about building an app with Node and, and Shopify. So what are we doing? Well, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're actually gonna make a request with this query to Shopify in order to retrieve 200 products. The first 200 products that match our query, what we're interested in. And in this case, it's any of products that have been tagged as gold. So they have gold as part of their components. And so this is an easy way for us to identify the relevant products out of the entire catalog. And I'm asking for the ID of those products. And because I'm actually ultimately interested in adjusting the price, I know that the price in Shopify lives on the variant. So I need to also take a look at the variant associated to that product and get the ID and in my case, the weight, because that's what we're gonna be using to calculate the new price. We don't care about the old price necessarily. We need the weight to determine what to charge going forward. I'm cheating a little bit right here. I know that every single one of my products only has a single variant. That's how I've set up my store. You might have to um, actually here play around with a larger number and actually take a look to see if products have more than one variant. They might have up to 100. That's how many we support on Shopify. And that would result in potentially some pagination and other things as you're building a little bit more nested of a query. But for our purposes, this works fine. And so ultimately what I'm doing after that is I'm coming down here and I am making the request with this query. I don't have any variables. It's just a, a straightforward query. And I'm gonna capture those results and I'm gonna print them out to my console. So let's take a look and see how that all works. Great. So. This query executed, I can go to the top, uh, 200 different products. So actually I don't even get all of that in my terminal, but we can see here, I actually might simplify this a bit. So let's go with 10. Let's run the 10. And the reason I did that is because it's important to see that the response we get starts with a products key in this JSON. 
and then we get our edges, each of these edges representing the object which we're interested in or the node which we're interested in, which happens to be a product. And then for each of these nodes, we see that we have the ID and then the variants that are also a part or associated with that product. Fantastic, this is great. This is the information I need to be able to implement my app. Well, what's next? We also know that there are uh, costs associated to making a query and to making updates. And so we wanna be able to get a sense of how much room do we have left on our API rate limit. And Shopify does a really good job of providing this back to you in the form of an extension to your response. And we don't necessarily aren't able to grab it with this particular library by just making a standard request. So down here, I have another form of that request that actually uses the raw request input. And what we're doing here is we're simply making the exact same request with the same query, but instead of just getting a data set back, which represents the actual data returned from that query, we're also getting extensions, we're getting any headers, errors, and statuses that are part of that request as well. So all that metadata that's happening when this request goes back and forth. And in this case, I'm gonna actually make the exact same request, but also capture and print out how much rate limit I have available after this request goes through. So let's go ahead and do that and see what that looks like. There we go. So now if I go to the top, I have 958 rate limit points available, and then I have the data that I'm capturing here. Well. That's great, 958, that's a lot. If we remember our bucket fills a thousand points. Um, and so I have a lot of room here to still play around, make requests. But as the next step in our process, I'm actually gonna be looking to update these products. And so each of these different products, I'm gonna have to make a mutation for, and I'm gonna have to update them individually. And so with GraphQL, the way that the, the complexity of the cost works, it's charged one point for every nested property or data field that you're capturing. But then for mutations, you actually have uh, 10 cost points to run a mutation. So each of these different products is gonna cost 10 query points or rate limit points. And so you can see that if I'm gonna be making a number of requests, I could probably eat into that 958 pretty quickly. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, great, I have my data here. The next thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm actually gonna to wanna to go ahead and action it. So we have it in this particular format, and what I'm interested in now is taking every single one of these product IDs and running a mutation on it. So I need to be able to fetch this product ID from this response, and how am I gonna do that? Well, I see that this is an array. It's an array of different JSON objects, so I could probably just index into that array, and I'm gonna do so by defining a new variable. I'm gonna call it edges. And edges is actually just gonna be uh, data, and it's gonna be under the products, under the edges key there. So now I'm going, I'm taking a look at my data, which is this entire object, going into products, going into edges, and then I get access to this array of products effectively. So um, I could even call this product edges, and I have all of that available. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna loop through each one of these different um, edges so that I can access each product independently. So let's go ahead and write a quick for loop. So we're gonna say let edge equal zero and edge. We just want it to be less than the total number of edges that we have in our array. And we're just gonna increment that each time. So now we're able to go and index into each of these individual arrays. And once I do that, there's some data that I need, right? So I need, I want the product ID and the product ID is actually gonna be equal to, in our case, it's our product edges at the appropriate index. And once I have that, then I need to actually index into the node key and then into the ID key. And that's gonna give me my product ID. And the next thing that I'm gonna look into is my variant ID. So similarly, we're gonna go project edges. In this case, I'm going to nest again into the node, but this time into edges. And here, gotta remember that edges still is an array. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume, again, this is where me being a little bit hacky here, knowing there's just a single one, ideally this is gonna be paginated over a couple of different options, but I know that we have a single variant. So I'm just gonna go in and grab the first one. And then there, I'm gonna go into the node and I'm gonna get the ID. And I can just copy this again and just change this variant ID to a variant weight. And instead of referencing the ID key, I'm gonna reference the weight key. So I have, all this stuff now, and if this works, I should be able to actually probably just log this stuff to my console, and I could do something along the lines of product, and here we could interpolate product ID, and variant, and interpolate variant ID has a weight of, and here we go, variant weight, awesome. So if all of this runs smoothly, I should be able to save this, and I could clear my console, clear my terminal, run it, ooh, 
Cannot read property zero of undefined. Okay, why is that the case? Let's take a look. Um, where is this happening? Line 52, 52, variant ID, projects, edges, node, edges, zero. Um, why are we not able to access the first element of this? So we're going into edges, we're going into the node, we have ID, ah, yes, because I skipped the key, the variant key. So uh, I'm trying to go from node directly into edges, but I'm missing this key here that has effectively accesses those different edges. So I can just update this variance, and then I'll do the same right here, variance, awesome. So if I give that a save, we clear this, run it again, scroll to the bottom, oh, node property is not available. And why is that? We have our edges, no, it doesn't belong here. There we go. Now it should be good. We're gonna clear this one final time and run it. Let's take a look one more time, line 52. It's saying edges is not available. If we take a look, what are we doing? We're going from product edges into the variance. Oh, so no, it should be coming before variance. All right, now this one, if this doesn't work, then I have no more ideas, but <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about it now. Okay. Great, so as we can see now, we're printing out the product ID, the variant ID, and the weight. Oh, the weight here I notice is undefined. So something that I'm doing must be incorrect, and there we go. I'm actually referencing it as variant weight. This, the key for that field is just weight. So I can give that a save, and now we should be good. All the different weights, amazing. So now I have an ability to access all the different data points that I know from my objects that I'm gonna to need to actually implement the mutation. Well, what are we doing next? So I'm gonna take a look and I'm gonna update the price of the product. And the way I'm gonna get that new price is I'm gonna say updated price is going to equal the weight of the product times the how much it weighs. So the price, gold price per gram. And because Shopify expects a double here in terms of the data type, I'm actually gonna just fix this to two decimal points so that we don't get any funky behavior. It expects it that maybe I'm, I'm treating those decimals as periods, it turns it into thousands or something like that. But this should allow us to set it up to two decimal points representing cents, which is what we're looking for. Awesome, so I have this updated price. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna need to pull up the mutation to update a price of a product. And um, lucky enough for me, I have just copied that over down here for simplicity's sake. So I'm just gonna bring it up into our function and into our for loop. I created a variable called product update mutation. And I know that within Shopify, this mutation is just called product update. It expects an input field of type product input. And then it also will return to us the ID of the product that's been updated because that's what we're requesting. Fantastic, so we have the mutation. The next thing that we need is we actually need to create the input. So we can actually take a look to see what this looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and open a new window. Awesome, so this is our product update mutation. And as we can see here, I can scroll down and I can take a look at the input field, the product input, take a look at that. And these are all the different input fields that I get access to. So I get access to the ID, which is how I specify what I wanna update. And I can adjust here things like meta fields or publications, but really what I'm interested in is the variance because that's again where my price lives. So I'm gonna to have to provide an ID, I'm gonna to have to provide a variance key, and then I'm gonna to have to provide the, the properties associated to the product variant input. In my case, again, that's gonna be another ID, and that's gonna be the price by the price uh, key as well. So let's take a look at how to do something like this. So I wanna create an input, so let's just call this product input, and this will just be a, a map, and here we'll have an ID that's gonna be equal to our product ID, and then we're also gonna have variance. And variance actually is an array because we get a multiple of them and each of them are map of their own, of their variant ID. And then lastly, the price. And the price here, we wanna update to the updated price for this particular edge or product. Because again, we're looping through all of them right here. So every time we're calculating an updated price here, it's for one particular product. And we have that captured within our product input. So now I have everything that I need to be able to execute this mutation, which is fantastic. So the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna call this. So I'm gonna go constant, let's just say mutation data equals, I'm gonna wait for the response of the GraphQL client and I'm gonna make a request. It's gonna be a standard request and this request I'm gonna have uh, the product update mutation passed in as well as the product input. And I'll just catch any errors in case there's one that we want to be able to log and I'll go ahead and just log that. That should be all that I need to do. If I save this, clear my terminal and run it again, what we should expect to see is the for loop going through each one of those products, making an update and updating uh, the price. But also here we might wanna actually just log what we're seeing. So I will log the stringified version of the mutation data. And this is just for formatting. It helps keep things clean uh, by adding some white space around 
uh, the new lines. And so if I save this, we should be getting the response back from each of these different mutations that we run. So let's give that a try. Okay, well, um, what are we seeing here? Variable input of type product was provided invalid value response. Okay, so something from our product input, it doesn't like. Let's take a look at the keys that we're supposed to be providing here. So if I go back into the input fields for product input, I have variance. Did I make sure I spelled that correctly? Yep, that's fine. The one thing I forgot to realize is that it's, yes, it's expecting us to have the data here in terms of the input format that we saw in the documentation, but this all actually needs to be nested within a map where we specify that it is an input. Otherwise, there is confusion around that component. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. I'm gonna clear my console and pretty confident that this should work. Great. So now we're seeing success here. It's going through, it's looping through each of our products. It's retrieving the values and then it's making that update, seeing that there's no errors here. We're getting our product ID back as well, which is great. Okay, so this works. What are we missing? Well, first of all, we don't really know how many, uh, how much rate limit we still have available when we're making these requests. So we don't know when we're gonna potentially run into an error. Let's fix that. Um, how do we fix that? Well, as we saw earlier, we actually have the ability to be able to make a raw request where we capture all of that information. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do that. I'm going to go await GraphQL client dot raw request. And I'm going to pass in the same query, which is the product update mutation. And then I'm going to pass in our input, which is our product input. And what I'm actually going to then do is I'm going to use the then clause to be able to wait until this execution is done to do some other business logic. And I'll tell you, explain why I'm, I'm structuring my query this way this time uh, momentarily. So in this case, I can go ahead and now I need to provide, okay, what do I expect the input to be or what do I expect the response format to be? And it's gonna be of this type for this particular method on the function. So I can now go ahead, do that, and I can define what needs to happen. And here, this is where I would most likely just log what we're seeing earlier. So I could probably come in here and I could log the data and I could uh, log that as stringified just to make sure it doesn't, parse as an object. Again, formatting it to look nice. And then what else I'm going to log is similarly to before, I want to know how much API rate limit I still have available. So I'm just going to copy this request. I'm going to paste that here. Go ahead and comment this out for now. Now that we have it, I have my extension. I'm taking a look at my cost and we're seeing how much we have available, which is great. So I'm going to save this and then we're going to clear our console and see what it looks like when we actually get a view of how much availability we have as well. Fantastic. So let's take a look. If I start at the beginning, what we see here is when we made that initial request, we had 958 rate limit points left because we were making a query for 10 different products and that's how much that all cost. Now, when we get to making the actual mutations, that's after we get the data back, we see that we start with 969 rate limit points, but by the time we make that second mutation, we actually have 975 rate limit points and this increases again by seven to 982. And what we're witnessing here is actually pretty interesting. It's the fact that the amount of time it takes us to make that mutation, wait for the response, print the response, and make the next mutation actually gives our leaky bucket algorithm the chance to empty out again and leave us with more room to make future requests. Because as we recall, we get 50 more points every second. So since a mutation is just 10 points, we're seeing that because it's taking less than a second, but close to it, we're able to refill our rate limit faster than we're able to use it. This means in theory that I would be able to let this run for as long as I have products available and I'm not gonna run into my rate limit. And that is true. This will not run into a rate limit if it's constantly able to refill faster than you're able to consume it. But the problem with this structure is that you're not optimizing your rate limit either. Shopify gives you a thousand rate limit points use it. That's what helps your app operate as efficiently, as performant as it can. So how can we go, how can we get around this? Well, one thing we could do is I can come here and I could actually remove this await. And with Node.js, what that basically does is it allows me to make a request that has some sort of future associated to it. There's something that ultimately this request will return. And I can tell it with the wait command whether I want to wait for that to complete or not. And if I don't, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna go through my for loop and as fast as it can get through my for loop, it's gonna keep making these requests. And that's gonna definitely consume my API rate limit faster. Let's see what that looks like in action. A couple things I'm gonna do to change. I'm actually just gonna add a catch clause here because I'm expecting an error. Also just good to have in terms of best practice. I could just log that error. And the other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back up here and instead of trying to retrieve 10 products at once, I'm gonna retrieve 100, make that a little bit more. So let's go ahead and do that. 
I have the rest of this available. We can get rid of some of this commented out code. And now I should be able to save this, come over here, clear my terminal and run it again. Awesome. So a lot happened here. I don't think I'm actually be able to see the history of all of it, but we see a number of errors. We see we got throttled a couple times. If I scroll down, um, when we are making some of these requests, we see we only have three rate limit points left. And so clearly this doesn't work well. If we're running into errors, if it's not able to actually complete what we needed to complete, like this isn't good production level code. We need to have some safeguards in place to prevent this. But what it does do is it brings our rate limit down to three, as in it eats up all that 1,000. And that's a good thing. It's, it's consuming as much as it can. The problem is that it's consuming more than it should. So we need to find a way for it to, to optimize it without going over our rate limit. That's what we're going to do next. Then one way to do that is to actually pair up a sequence of synchronous and asynchronous requests. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I, every time we go through this for loop, I don't want to wait for every single request. That's not fast enough. I'm going to wait for every other request. And that makes me effectively in a second or in the amount of time it takes for a single request to process to send two requests instead. And what we should see there as a result is our rate limit decrease over time. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. So let's say we're, we're keeping track of the index of this loop using our edge parameter. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create um, a little conditional statement here that says if our edge is uh, even or every other edge is equal to zero using a modulus function, what I'm going to want to do is I am going to want to, I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to want to wait for this to complete. And if it's not, then I'm actually gonna wanna run it synchronously, asynchronously. Great, so what this means is now when I start, I'm gonna actually wait for that response to come in. The next time I go through this, I'm actually gonna not wait, and then I'm gonna wait again. So I'm putting through two requests in, but only waiting every other one. And so what does this look like in practice? Let's just save it, let's have a look. I think it's easier to see. So now as we see these, our API rate limit, it's increasing pretty slowly, right? It's increasing, It's sometimes it goes up a little bit and, and whatnot as, as the, network times and all that stuff comes into play here. But over time, if I let this run indefinitely, if I have an indefinite list of products, we can see that it is starting to consume our API rate limit. But we're still sitting around like 500, 568. And what that means is maybe it's not as fast as it can be. And so we can actually make more requests at once. And so I'm actually gonna just do a little best practice here. I'm gonna to associate this to a variable, number of par parallel requests. And here I'm actually gonna just do three. I'll copy this and I'll, I'll push it here, save that right there, fantastic. And now I should actually be able to see if I clear this out, run it again, that that number goes down a lot faster. So 562, 551, we're getting to the 400s, we're getting lower. This just means that my app's moving a lot faster. This is great. Um, I'm actually not even gonna, maybe I will wait for this to finish. No, it doesn't actually hit the rate limit before it's done iterating through those 100 products. Okay, well, what's next? Clearly we can see there's there's a little act of optimization here. We wanna make this number as high as possible without actually running into the rate limit, getting this to zero. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna implement a safety net to ensure that even if I do, um, let's say consume uh, a lot of my API rate limit, I'm approaching that zero, I don't make a request when it doesn't look like I have much left in terms of my rate limit. And how do we do that? Well, we're capturing and returning that in the logs right here. Let's tie that to a variable so we have it on hand to use. And I'm gonna come down here to do that. I'm gonna create a new variable called uh, available rate limit. Start that by equaling that to zero. And then I'm just gonna take that here and right when we're making these requests, I'm also gonna set that to whatever value we're getting back from Shopify in that extension. I'm gonna do that in both of these different clauses. So now I have a, a way to keep track of how much I have left, which is great. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set some sort of threshold that prevents me from making requests when I'm below that much rate limit to prevent me again from getting below zero, hitting those 429 responses. For that, I'm gonna define another variable. I'm gonna call it rate limit threshold. For me, I'm gonna set this to 50. Now, why 50? Is this arbitrary? Not necessarily. For me, the, the way I'm kind of doing this math is I know every mutation costs 10 query points. I'm doing about three of them at once. So I'm seeing about 30 requests, 30 points that I'm using for the amount of time it takes to do one request, to wait one request. And so 30 is less than 50, and, and the number of requests that I'm, the, the amount of time I'm waiting for requests is roughly about a second based on what I'm seeing. So this math should check out. And what I'm expecting to happen here is that sometimes I'll be off and it'll approach 
getting below 50, but that's when we're going to implement our business logic to deal with that. So what is that business logic? Let's come down here again. What I want to do now is I want to actually take a look to see what's that value that's stored in my available rate limit. After I've made those requests, what do I have left? And if that's less than my rate limit threshold, my acceptable threshold that I've defined myself, then I actually want to tell my application and wait a second hold on, we don't have room to keep making these requests indefinitely. That's going to hit a bunch of 429s. It's going to potentially make Shopify think we're bought or whatever else. To build some good software, we're going to actually prevent making any requests that we know are going to hit a 429. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to first drop a little log that says not enough rate limit points. And then I could do anything like waiting one second. And now what we actually have to do is actually wait. And how we do that within Node at least is by implementing a new promise. And within this promise, I pass in a resolve parameter as well as now define what takes place within the promise. And in my case, it's going to be a timeout. For a timeout, I pass in a function in terms of what exactly is happening once that timeout is complete. In my case, I'm going to actually respond with a resolve, which is going to resolve this promise. And I'm just going to call that the rate limit wait. I'm going to log again here saying that uh, we're done waiting, continuing requests. And the last thing that I need to provide here into my set timeout function is a timeout. How long? Well, this is actually number of milliseconds. Uh, so I'm going to pass in a thousand, which means that we're waiting one second in total. Great. So what is this doing? Well, what this is doing is now it's telling me that if I ever have less than the acceptable 50 points available, I'm not going to actually go through this loop again and make three requests. I'm going to instead wait a second and then I'm going to make those requests. And this is just a, a little fail safe here to ensure that we're never bumping up against that rate limit um, the way we might if we're trying to make a bunch of requests at once and, and not capping ourselves. So let's see what this looks like in practice. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to clear this. The one other thing I'm going to do as well is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to increase the number of products I'm fetching. I'm going to fetch 249. 250 would put me over the 1,000 total points per query that I'm allowed. So I'm going to go ahead and save that to 249. Come over here and implement this or execute it. Great. So now we see a couple things. So um, when we do drop below 48, what we should be seeing is just some logs that say, I'm going to try to scroll up and find one, a log that says points available, we're done waiting, continuing requests. So here we're logging that we're done done waiting effectively. Um, and obviously, again, not, not having enough points and so executing that query. So the one thing here is that when we are running these promises in this way, um, there's a little bit of non-sequential output of the logs because each of these then executes whenever the request completes. But the end state of ensuring we're not making more requests when we're below our threshold holds true. Because if I scroll up here, we see a lot of output. We don't actually see any errors, which is great. There's a lot going on in terms of the console log. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to comment a couple things out. We don't actually need that anymore. Don't actually need that anymore either, nor that. And so if we, the only thing that we really want to be logging is I want to be logging how many API rate limits I have left. And I want to be logging when we're making these changes. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this one last time, clear this up, and we'll run it in a second. The, the one thing I do wanna say though is we're taking a look at one example of how to potentially implement some logic within your application to ensure that you're taking advantage of as much of your rate limit as possible without going over. It's definitely not the only solution. In a production app, you probably have a lot more available to you. You can implement some sort of queuing model where you uh, drop your request into a queue that's shared, a shared resource between uh, multiple threads. Um, potentially, you can defer some execution and drop some IDs into a database that you have a cron job or some sort of scheduled job, iterate over and make those requests at some regular cadence, like once a day, once, a, once an hour, whatever makes sense for your business model. But this should give you a sense of how we understand and what our rate limit availability is, as well as what to potentially do about it with our little fail safe here that protects us when things get too close. So now if I run this execution of this JS app one more time, here we see we have 50 rate limit points available. And so we, we wait a second. And then as we wait, our number increases again up to the hundreds because every second we wait, we get 50 more. And this way it's going through and it's updating all my products. Each one of these lines is basically a product update but I'm never concerned that it's gonna hate my rate limit. It's always taken care of. And I think that's the goal, is to ensure that you're opt optimizing, maximizing your use of your APIs, not going over, but also building a fast app that gets the, the job done for the merchants that you're uh, developing for. So 
yes, thank you so much. Um, I hope you found this video educational and it scratched the surface at least of what API rate limiting looks like, as well as what some practices are to be able to work on it. And there's gonna be a lot more videos coming out from our uh, YouTube channel. So if you're interested, please subscribe and check us out there. And if there's any topics that you might be interested in learning more about that we haven't already covered, drop a link down below and we'll be sure to get to those as well. So thanks so much and I'll catch you at the next one. Mm -hmm.